Amen. So, um, so we're talking about what it means to be human, and I want to talk tonight about the role of hope in being human. Now, if you were to turn to the book of Job and have a look and see what Job has to say about hope. Hope says there's hope if you're a tree. There's hope for a tree. If it's cut down, it will sprout again and its shoots will never cease. And though its stump grows old in the earth and its stump dies in the ground, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put forth branches like a young plant. So, um, according to Job, trees get all the breaks. It's all good for trees. But for the rest of us, it's not nearly as optimistic. Mortals die and are laid low. Humans expire, and where are they? A river wastes away and dries up, so mortals lie down and do not rise again until the heavens are no more. They will not awake or be roused out of their sleep. So, uh, so Job isn't nearly as optimistic about the role of hope for humans as apparently is for trees, which is a bit strange because as far as I know, trees don't actually hope for anything, right? It would have to be us that was hoping for something for the tree, and the tree has hope, but we don't. Something a little dodgy about that, I think. So um, here's the thing. Is there really any hope for us? Is there? And I've been looking at hope and and uh, other aspects of what it means to be human and referenced various TV shows and movies. And whenever you think of hope, um, the place to go is to this movie, The Shawshank Redemption. Hope is a dangerous thing, we're told. Hope can drive a man insane. Remember that famous scene? So, um, looking at hope is uh, what I'd like to do. And, you know, what is it? What is hope anyway? If you go look it up in a dictionary, and you'll recall dictionaries report usage, they don't determine meaning. The reports of uh, usage are all over the place. Like this little entry has hope as being a feeling. But towards the bottom, it's to do with trust. Well, I don't think of trust and hope as necessarily the same thing. It talks about desiring or believing. Those aren't the same to me as hope. So looking in uh, dictionaries, I don't think it's very helpful here because they're reporting people's usage and people use the word all sorts of different ways. Well, when philosophers write about hope, what they do is they have what's called the orthodox definition or the standard account of hope. Now, it's not that all philosophers agree with it. They've just said, for the purposes of our debate, hope looks like this. So now we know what we're talking about. And what are they talking about? They're talking about this. This would be the standard definition of hope in philosophical literature, that there are two things that are necessary. They're independently necessary and jointly sufficient for something to be hope. And what are those two things? Well, the first is that there has to be somebody doing the hoping. There has to be a hoper, strange word, someone who does the hoping. And the second is that what is hoped for has to fall within the range of physical possibilities. So it could be quite an improbable thing, but it still has to be possible. And it can't be something that's certain. If something is certain, then you don't have to hope for it, right? Or if something is logically possible, but really impossible, you can't hope for that either. So if we just carve that down a bit, it's something like this. Hope is something that's desired by the person who's hoping, and it's realistically possible, even if it's improbable. And that is the difference, I think, between hope and wishful thinking. You see, hope is realistic in the sense that it's possible, even if improbable, whereas wishful thinking is unrealistic. Like if you decide you're going to plan the rest of your life based on winning the lottery. <clears throat> so wishful thinking is unrealistic. It could even be something that's impossible or for which the probability is so low, it may as well be impossible. So uh, hope and wishful thinking are different from each other. And that got me to wondering, is hope something that only humans do? Is it part of being human to hope? Well, uh, I picked this picture of a man and a cow walking down the road. You might think that's a strange picture to pick. But I picked it because it turns out that a comparison of a man and a cow is what uh, Nietzsche does in talking about hope, which I'll explain to you in a minute. Those, these are the two that he uses, man, cow. 
So imagine a man and a cow walking down the road and they're heading back towards the farm. And the cow is in the habit of knowing that every day, about that time of day, somebody puts food in the trough and they eat it. So does that mean that the cow is hoping for that? Or is the cow anticipating it based on the past, the repetitive nature of the past? And the man also is perhaps thinking that when he gets back to the farmhouse, there'll be dinner on the table. But maybe he's thinking, oh, I hope we have chicken tonight, not beef, because I really like chicken. And you'd think that the question of whether it's chicken or beef would be much more important to the cow than to the man, but I doubt very much that the cow is thinking, oh, I hope they have chicken. Uh, so uh, there's a difference, I think, between anticipating something based on past experience, which is maybe what a cow does, and looking at the future and future possibilities, which is what the man does. Now, Nietzsche didn't quite agree with me on this. Nietzsche, in The Uses and Disadvantages of History for Life, which is a great book, says that animals are contained in the present and live unhistorically with no past, no concept of past, no concept of future. Now, being Nietzsche, he points out that uh, if you have no concept of past and no concept of future, there's a, there's a real uh, upside to this, and the upside to this is that you have no regrets over mistakes you made in the past, because you never think of the past. It doesn't shape you, it doesn't form you, so that's good. But, of course, Nietzsche wants to tell you that there's always a downside. And the downside is that you have no future plans to look forward to, because you only live in the present. So. Uh, Nietzsche thinks about living in the present is something that animals do, but when he talks about humans, he uses this sort of literary device and says, human existence is an imperfect tense that can never become perfect, which I really like. It's kind of elegant. What it means, of course, is um, if you've forgotten what they taught you in English class at school, I know not all of you have forgotten. It, what that means is, of course, an imperfect tense refers to an action that's incomplete, and a perfect tense refers to an action that is complete. So we live in the imperfect tense. Our lives are as yet incomplete, and we're moving forward into a future, and we'll never perfect it. We'll never get the whole thing completed and perfected. Now, not everybody uh, agrees with Nietzsche on this. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, one of my absolute favorites, he wrote a ton of stuff about animals and hope. I mean, you know, the Summa Theologica is, is about that thick, right? And there's pages and pages and pages of it about whether animals hope. He thought it was an important question. He maintained that higher animals have the capacity for hope, lower animals don't. But there's kind of like a degree, and he would say, like, we're up here on the slope, and maybe a little further down, chimpanzees maybe, a bit further down, dogs, all the way down here, earthworms. So, so what he's really saying is he saw a difference in degree between animals and, the, and humans, and uh, Nietzsche saw a difference in kind. One group do, one group don't. But I would say that either way, who was ever right about that, um, they would all agree that humans have a more highly developed sense of past and future, which means that we have a greater capacity for hope. And as we've been quoting Nietzsche, we also have to point out the downside. We have a greater capacity for regret over things that we've done in the past. So, Hope is associated with a desirable possible future, but regret is associated with an undesirable past which you cannot change because it's in the past. So there's an upside, there's always a downside that goes with it. But hope is, is a future-oriented idea, thinking of what might happen in the future and trying to uh, move your way to the more desirable future. So the question really is, if it's that future-oriented, what do you hope for? And it turns out that theologians worry about this a lot. And there's one, this guy called Jürgen Moltmann, who uh, spent his entire life working on and writing about the theology of hope. This just is one tiny quote from his dozens of books, where he says that hope sees reality in humankind in the hands of one, of God, whose voice calls into history from its end. 
So we have a vision of what a future might look like. And way out there in the fullness of time stands God. And God is calling us like that, saying, behold, I make all things new. And the reason that that matters is because if we can trust in that call, it empowers us to renew life here and now and to change the face of the world here and now. And that is, of course, what the church is all about, right? Like the mission of of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's what it says in the mission statement. Change the face of the world. Same idea. So that's kind of important, I think. Now, we usually talk about this in terms of the kingdom of God as being Jesus' vision of what the world could could look like. And Maltman says, so imagine that there's this vision of the world as it could be, and God is standing there calling you, saying, come on, I make all things new. Come towards me. It would be something we'd like to see happen, so it's desirable. And it's realistically possible, even if it seems today improbable. And I put it to you that, you know, if you read the newspapers and things like this, Sometimes you might uh, adopt the opposite of hope, which is despair, and think it's impossible. Well, it's not impossible. It's just improbable. It's hard to get it done. There are always barriers in the way. But it meets the criterion for hope, and that hope is important because it empowers us to acquire the freedom to renew life here and to change the face of the world. Now... In that little Romans 5 passage that I read to you, it says, hope does not disappoint us. Hmm. What do you think? Have you ever hoped for something and it just didn't come about and you were really disappointed? I bet, because I have. What Paul really means, of course, is he's talking about hope in God. The God who's standing there in the fullness of time saying, come this way here, that doesn't disappoint because God, and then he has the phrase, God's love has been poured into our hearts. God has empowered us to be able to respond to that and to move in that direction, which is in, um, turns out is in the direction of love. So we talked about faith last week and the role of faith in being human. Now we're talking about hope and that leads us to love, which is the three theological virtues, right? Faith, hope, and love, these three. So, um, and now I took those words of Paul's and the words of Maltman and tried to blend them together into something that might make sense a little bit, at least to me. So, hoping God does not disappoint us, says Paul, when we hear God's voice calling into history from its end, saying, behold, I make all things new, because we acquire the freedom to renew life here and to change the face of the world. It's a motivator. It's like a catalyst for the transformation of the world. That's what hope is. And when Paul writes about hope, he writes about it this way, that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. Now, I'm always a little cautious about passages that one might use or misuse to justify suffering. Now imagine that you thought, okay, so suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. So hope is a good thing, right? Which must mean then, say, if I cause you to suffer, I will help you produce character, and that will help produce hope. And that's wrong. That's just bad thinking. But people have used these passages these ways. So I'm always very cautious when we see passages that appear to elevate suffering or hurting other people. I think, there's something more about this. And there is. So if we take what we've said so far and look at this passage, I would say it looks like this. That when we look back on our past experiences, and there's something lying back there that was suffering right? I think everybody's got one of those, maybe more than one of those, something that was hard and difficult and and painful. But here's the good news, you're standing here today. So somehow you, you managed to get through that. And so when you look back on past experience of suffering, and you know that you've made it through somehow because you're here today, that's endurance. You did it. By the way, congratulations, I'm very proud of you. Whatever it was that you made it through and managed to come out the other side and you're still standing up, that's really great, that's endurance. 
And that type of endurance, I'm sure you know, changes you. That's the bit about shaping your character. It just changes you, enduring something like that coming out the other side. And it's that type of character that enables you to look to the future in hope because you know that when the going gets really tough, that somehow you're able to make it through because you already did it once. All of you, I bet. So that's a really good thing. Um, hope matters. The idea that it's a catalyst, that it helps us acquire the freedom to renew life here and to change the face of the world is important because that differentiates it from wishful thinking. Wishful thinking is hoping for something that's never, ever going to come about. Hope is something that's possible. Even if it's difficult, even if it's improbable, it can still happen. And the other thing that is important about hope, and a particularly human thing, I think, is that in many ways hope is the antidote to despair. Despair is when you can't see a possible future that's worth living into. So, according to Maltman, uh, God is there calling us towards a world that's better, saying, I'm making all things new. And in, uh, the, in the book of Revelation, towards the end of the book, it says, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And I suspect that that's uh, really well said, that the idea that God is calling us into a possible future, a possible future that's better, more desirable than the one we have now, which is what hope is all about, is both trustworthy and true. So that's an important thing, I think. Hope, it, hope matters. It's part of what it means to be human. And it's how we will ultimately make the world a better place. We can't give up on hope and fall into despair. And we can't move from hope into wishful thinking or we'll never get anywhere. So we have to focus on what we really hope for and how we bring that about. What is it that we're moving towards and how will we get there? And to be empowered by the idea even if it's only an image in your mind, that out there at the end of time stands God, and God is calling you, saying, I make all things new. It's a pretty powerful image, I think. And I know that we can hope, because every one of us in this room has had bad things happen, and every one of us is still standing up. Well, you're not actually standing up right now, but you know what I mean. Everybody standing up after moving through something that was really, really bad. And that type of endurance that produces character, that produces hope, really matters. It's not that the suffering was a good thing in and of itself, but you made it. That's really, that's really great. Good for you. And the fact that you made it means that next time something happens, you can have hope that you'll be able to make it again. And I think you will. And I think that matters.